Welcome to Scripps Research. Uh, my name is Jamie Williamson. I'm Executive Vice President here at Scripps Research. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our front row presentation by uh, Professor Christian Anderson. Uh, I think you'll all be able to relate to the subject matter of what he's talking about. Now, I think everybody can relate to uh, viruses. So is there anybody in the room that has never had the flu? Okay, so this is so you personally understand the challenges associated with viruses, and there's all kinds of different viruses. Uh, flu happens every year. There's a cycle, and one of the things that makes it so difficult to deal with is that viruses have this inherent ability to mutate, and this has set up this uh, essentially arms race between the viruses and our immune system. So the immune system is always trying to adapt what the new tricks the virus is throwing at you. And every once in a while, some, there's major events where something, you know, there's a terrible flu pandemic. Uh, many of you probably remember the SARS ec epidemic, where a new virus sprouts up and we don't know how to combat it. And uh, one of those stories is uh, the Zika virus, which was really a terrible uh, epidemic that swept the globe. And so uh, I'm going to let Christian tell you much more about what happened. but. Uh, Christian is, is basically uh, one of the pioneers of using new genomic techniques that allow you to track and monitor in real time the spread of viruses and through a population throughout the country. And it's, it's really what we need to do is throw a lot of resources into this sort of thing so that we can uh, actually respond to these novel threats. You're always hearing some outbreak. And, and so we need to translate the uh, tools that we're developing here at Scripps, in large part by Christian, into different ways of approaching and combating viruses as a global and a national uh, priority. So uh, again, welcome uh, to Scripps. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Christian, who will give you uh, a really uh, compelling story about his uh, work here at Scripps. So let's welcome Christian. So can somebody tell me what I just showed you here? Somebody who hasn't seen me give a talk before. <laughs> Spread a virus, exactly. It's, it's a particular virus. H1N1? H1N1, exactly. So what I showed you here is that I showed you exactly how H1N1 in 2009, which is this new flu strain that came out right, and spread across the world really, really rapidly. Now, this was interesting because it only took six weeks to spread as far and as fast as the virus typically takes about six months. So this shows you exactly how that actually happened. It shows you how the virus is spreading. But it's actually also showing you another thing, which is the why is it spreading? Because what this is also is airline traffic. So when we're talking about flu, well, it really spreads via airlines, right? So it shows you the spread of the virus, and it also shows you exactly how it is actually spreading. So those are the kinds of questions that we're interested in. So we're interested in trying to explain how do these viruses actually spread, either across the world or within individual countries and between countries as well. We're trying to understand why is it that they're actually spreading, what is contributing to the spread of these viruses. And then I think most importantly, and, and Jamie alluded to this, is that we're actually hoping to use that knowledge to do something about it, right? This is not just an academic exercise where we're trying to show something. This is actually something we are hoping to use that kind of knowledge for public health response. Now, I mentioned flu. Jamie mentioned flu. I don't actually study flu. Now, the four primary viruses that we are studying are the following. So it all started out, I got interested in viruses and started out with this virus is called Lassa virus. Lassa virus is a viral hemorrhagic fever, is endemic in, in Africa, West Africa specifically. We then switched focus to Ebola a little later when the big West African outbreak occurred. And then more recently into Zika when that big epidemic across the Americas and then much more recently into West Nile as well. 
So we study a lot of different viruses, right? And we're just interested in how do the outbreaks work and how do these viruses work. Now, one of the things that we do, which is a little special, is that we actually study these viruses where they are. So we don't just sit in our lab here at Scripps, having a good time, looking at the ocean. We actually travel to where these viruses are. So we worked in West Africa, for example, for a little over a decade now, working with partners there, working with scientists, and working with doctors to actually study the viruses where they are. Now, I say we, I'm going to present some of my work, but actually, I haven't done any of the work that I'm going to show you today. <laughs> these guys have. So everything I say, and I say we, I really mean them. They're here, and they're over there, too. So these are really the heroes that do this type of work every day. It's not me, I just try and make sure that the lights are actually on. And I'm also pretty excited because this summer we had the future of science also visiting us. So we had a uh, you know, bunch of interns that came to the lab working on these wild projects. So this is something that we're really excited about. So going back to the kinds of questions that we we're interested in. So this is a map just at, um, showing the cholera epidemic in London. This was with John Snow. And I should say it's the real one, not the you know, girlfriend killing sort of weepy one on TV. <laughs> Um, but John did something that was pretty simple, right? So he was interested in understanding the, the cholera outbreak in London. Something very simple, which was he just plotted out where do people die. So this is a pretty morbid map, but essentially it's just showing where did people die in London. And what he then did was triangulation, saying, well, in the middle of where the most people are dying, there's actually a water pump right there. So he just deduced from that, saying that, well, that makes sense. Maybe cholera is actually coming from the water pump. So by this, he described both how it is spread, he understood why it was, and then importantly, you can dismantle the water pump, you can actually do something about it, right? All just in one little map here, which I think is pretty remarkable. Now, we're interested in this, it's the same sort of questions, but today we can do something which is a little bit more sophisticated, and we call this genomic ep epidemiology. So genomic epidemiology, what is involved in this is that you can imagine you have a patient coming in during an outbreak, during an epidemic, this could be somebody with Ebola, somebody with Zika. We take a sample from that individual, and then we sequence the virus out of the blood of that individual. And when you do genomic sequencing, typically you might think about human genomes. We're not interested in human genomes here. We're looking at the viral genomes, right? So the viruses that are actually infecting these patients. And we use that information to, you know, we can do things like diagnostic, prevention, and treatment, but ultimately that's what we're hoping that our findings are actually leading into. So the reason why we can do this is something very simple. And again, Jamie mentions this too, which is that viruses mutate. So when viruses actually spread through people, for example, during an epidemic, imagine that you have the first patient sera here being infected. When that patient then infects the next patient, chances are that the virus picks up a single mutation somewhere in the genome. And then that patient infects another patient, and again, the virus actually picks up a, a mutation as part of this process. So this is the kind of information that we use to then try and understand these outbreaks. And let me just go into this a little bit further. So if we take these viruses and we talk about these mutations that crop up, right? Well, they're encoded in the genome. So every single virus that come out of a patient will then have these mutations, and we can use sequencing of the viruses themselves to actually get to these mutations and understand exactly how do the viruses look in each individual patient. So when we have this kind of information, what we're now interested in is to understand how are these viruses all related? How is virus one from patient one related to patient three over here, for example? And this is quite simple. It's similar to if you think about family trees, right? So this is a simple family tree with granny and grandpa. There's a mom, there's me and a brother. On the other side, same grandpa, granny, dad, and then a me and a brother, right? So it's just a family tree. It shows you how is everybody connected like this. And what's important here is that we can do the same with genomics. So typically, again, this has been done with human genomics, for example, where you can see this is you know, human genomes, and then you can cluster them into, for example, there's some Norwegians, Danes here, Germans, actually Danes and Germans are very highly related. I'm, I'm Danish, I have postdocs that are Germans. Um, and Belgian, you know, you have the Swedes, you have other, other people, right? But what is important is that everybody clusters distinctly here. So you can use this to say that, yep, you're definitely Danish, yep, you're definitely Finnish, and so on and so forth. 
This is exactly what we do with the viruses, right? So if we go back to this family tree and say, okay, now we're not interested in human genomics. Again, we're interested in understanding how are these viruses all related. So the first thing is that, well, I mentioned that viruses pick up these mutations. We can actually look at that. So this is an example from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, for example. We say, okay, over time, as the outbreak goes on, what you can see is that in the viral population, in all the viruses, you get there more and more mutations. So the longer it takes, the more mutations you see in the viral population. This is exactly the signal we're interested in. What you can also see is this is a very linear correlation, right? So the clock at which mutations are accumulated are very consistent over time. And this is the kind of information that we use to actually figure out how are these viruses related. So based on this information, we create these family trees. We call them phylogenetic trees. So this is a family tree which shows you exactly, okay, how are all these viruses actually connected? So if you look at this a little bit, what this big family tree, this big phylogenetic tree, it essentially shows you how is virus one, for example, up here connected to virus two, how is virus three into all of that, and how are some of these, all of these viruses down here. So it shows you the connection between all of these viruses, right? Again, because we sequence the viral genomes from the patients and we're able to create these family trees. But what's important here is that while this shows you the connection of the viruses, of course, these viruses came from patients. So we can use this very information to say, well, patient one had this virus, patient two had this virus, and patient three had this virus. And now, because we know based on these family tree or phylogenetic trees, we know how the viruses are actually related, we now know how the patients, the virus is spreading between the patients exactly how they are connected. Now, when we talk about the viral sequence, we actually have two additional level of information that we get, which is we have the sequence, yes, but then we also have a location. So we know where was that patient when they got infected. When we found that virus, where was it actually in the world? In which country, which district within that country, and so on and so forth. We also have a date, so we know when that was actually collected. And this is important because all of this gets down on a time scale, so we actually know the time scales of exactly when things are connected together. So again, we take a sequence, we attach a location, and we attach a date to that viral sequence. And now we can take this information, and we can actually do something which is pretty cool, which is that we can get a dynamic view of exactly how these viruses are actually spreading. So for example, here's an example from the Zika epidemic. And as you can see, as the animation goes on, it's through time, right? So we get exactly a picture of how did the virus spread during the epidemic. Over here, for example, getting an example of how Ebola spread during the West African outbreak. And down here, for example, getting a picture of how West Nile was actually spreading in this particular country. So just based on this information, we can get this animation, this dynamic picture of exactly how these viruses are spreading uh, over time. So when we're going back to John Snow's map here, what we're really doing is that we're going from this static view of what, you know, at some point, what does the out outbreak actually look like, to getting a complete picture of exactly how is this outbreak evolving, what is the dynamic, how does it look over time. So this is the kind of information that we then use to, first of all, display this, how is the virus spreading, how is the virus transmitting, how is it actually spreading between people? And let me just show you one example, because some of the information you can get for this is very fundamental, very important to understanding outbreak, more generally speaking. So this is an example from the Ebola outbreak. It started in 2014 or end of 2013 in West Africa. Big Ebola outbreak, right? Almost 30,000 cases. And when this outbreak started, like early on in the outbreak, this was the kind of messaging that people got, which was that, you have to be careful with bushmeat, you have to be careful with bats, because that's how you get Ebola. The problem is that that's not how people get Ebola. Maybe the first patient zero, but once you have an Ebola outbreak, every Ebola patient is getting Ebola from somebody else with Ebola. So when you're telling people actually shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't eat bushmeat, the problem is that you're A, telling many people not to eat, that's not good during an Ebola outbreak, but you're also telling people that if you don't eat bats, you don't get Ebola. So that is obviously a huge risk factor. Now, it comes in our study where we can show that actually this is a single outbreak that's all one human-to-human -human transmission chain, meaning that every patient is getting Ebola from somebody else with Ebola.
you can use that kind of information to help change the messaging. So going from this to something like that, which is you have to wash your hand, you have to be careful around people with Ebola, for example. And again, this was because we could show with these types of studies that actually this outbreak is all caused by human-to-human -human transmission. There are no bats involved in this particular outbreak. So these are very simple questions that we get from these kinds of things. So let me show you one story um, that we did where we used this type of data to reconstruct exactly how Zika spread during the epidemic and importantly got into Florida and into this country. So this is, you know, Kartik in my lab here, and Kartik makes these fancy, you know, movies of showing things going around. But here's an animation he created where he showed exactly how, you know, Zika was spreading during the larger sort of uh, Asian version of this. So it started in Micronesia here, and in a little bit you'll see it hits France, Polynesia, and then look over here, hits Brazil. And then once it hits Brazil, this is when we really got this massive American outbreak um, of uh, the, the Zika epidemic, right? So again, shows you exactly over time how the virus actually spread during this epidemic. And now it's going back in time, which is kind of worrying. Um, but this is what we were interested in, right? So we got really interested in this Zika epidemic, and specifically, we got very interested in understanding the Zika outbreak in Florida and how that was connected to the large epidemic. Again, work led by Kartik and then also Nate uh, Grubau, who was a postdoc in my lab. He's now faculty at Yale. So the outbreak of Zika in Florida, so it's in 2016. And what you can see is that during 2016, there was lots of travel-associated cases across this country as well as in, in Florida here in gray. So these are cases of Zika that go somewhere, travel somewhere around the world. They get Zika, they come back to this country, and then they get diagnosed with it. But importantly, in late July of 2016, this is when we had the first local case of Zika. So this is somebody who hasn't traveled, somebody who didn't have a risk factor of actually having acquired Zika outside the country. This is somebody who got infected in this country specifically, and specifically in Florida. And then in the ensuing months, you know, a few four to five months or so, there's about 250 described cases of Zika in Florida. Right. Now, the vast majority of these cases, about 95% or so, were in Miami-Dade. So the major, you know, almost all the cases were in Miami-Dade. A couple in the surrounding counties and then a single one up in Pinellas here, right? So really clustered down here. And now what we do is that we get samples from the patients and then we sequence the viruses out of the patients. And this is the kind of information that we're going to be using. We also did something a little special again with Florida Department of Health here, had mosquito traps across the transmission zones where there was actually Zika, Little River, Windward, and Miami Beach. I had captured about 30,000 mosquitoes as part of this. And some of these mosquito traps came up positive for the virus, specifically the ones you see the stars in Miami Beach here. So now we could also get the virus out of the mosquitoes. So now we have, and Zika is transmitted by this Aedes aegypti mosquito and humans. So now we have the virus from the humans and we have the virus from the mosquitoes. We got a total of about 35 sequence. And remember the outbreak is about 250 total described cases. So based on that kind of information, we were interested in understanding something very, a couple of very fundamental questions about the outbreak. They're simple, but they're really fundamental to understanding what's going on here. Questions like, when did the outbreak actually start? When did the virus arrive into this country? How many times did it get in here? Something happens once, or something happens many times. Where did it come from and how? And why is it that we actually see this outbreak in Miami-Dade and in Southern Florida and not actually in other parts of the country? So these were the kinds of questions we were interested in and we were actually able to answer with our studies here. So the first one was that, well, when did this really start? So we had this first local case that was described in a hospital was in July of 2016. But the question was, was that really when the outbreak started or did it actually happen earlier? And what we could show is that the outbreak actually started quite a bit earlier than we thought. So it wasn't in July, it actually started somewhere, probably three, two to three months or so earlier here, March and April of 2016. So the outbreak actually had been going on for about three months or so in Florida before we realized that we had the outbreak because we detected that first case in, in Florida, right? So there was this, gap in the outbreak starting and us 
realizing we had the outbreak. Now, because we were part of some large-scale studies here, we can actually ask that question um, across multiple different countries. So Mike Warby made this little uh, uh, overview figure here, but essentially asking when we're looking at these surveillance gaps, they're actually really big when we look across all of the Americas. So for example, when you look in Brazil here, well, the initial detection of that was in 2015, but we estimate that that outbreak, and this is what you see in blue here, actually started more than a year earlier, probably a year and a half earlier than that is actually when that outbreak started itself. So we had a full one and a half year where we had this massive Zika epidemic going on and we had no idea because we weren't looking. And what's really important here is that by the time we realize we have an epidemic, imagine that at that point you could do everything to, you could do to stop an outbreak. We can't actually do that, but imagine you could do that. It wouldn't actually matter because by the time we realized we had this outbreak, it had already spread across all the rest of the countries in America. So I find this really remarkable that for one and a half years, we can have this massive epidemic of a virus or disease going on, and we just have no idea because we aren't actually looking. Zika wasn't really, it wasn't known to be in this continent. We didn't actually realize that it could cause these kinds of microcephaly and, and lots of severe disease. So we didn't really look for it. So these surveillance gaps are really, really big, no matter where we look for, for things like Zika. So, okay, so we know now that it happened earlier than we thought, right? So again, in Florida, we detected in July, but the outbreak actually started three months earlier than that. The question was that when these outbreaks start, how many times does the virus actually come into the country? Is it something that only happens once, which is, for example, with Ebola, somebody gets infected, patient zero, and then you have a big outbreak, right? The virus only comes in once. We were interested in understanding exactly the same question for Zika. So when we look at that, what we can show is that it's actually, this is something that happens multiple times. It's not just that the virus comes into Florida once and then it causes an outbreak, something that happens repeatedly over and over and over and over again. So when you have an outbreak like this, it's really something that happens many, many times. And the way that we can do that is we just look at our family trees, our uh, phylogenetic trees. We show there's at least an introduction here because there's a cluster, there's another cluster here, a cluster here, and a cluster here. And every time we have a cluster, this is a single introduction. So we can show that, well, at least for the sequences we had, there was at least four separate introductions. But remember that we only had 35 sequences, right? But the entire outbreak in Florida was 250 cases. So if we extrapolate for that, we find that it's something like 30 to 40 times or so the virus comes in, gets into the local mosquito population, and then causes cases in order to have an outbreak of 250 cases. But importantly, 250 cases, Zika in most people don't really come with symptoms, so there's many, many more overall cases. So this, the true number here is probably at least an order of magnitude. I wouldn't be surprised if there's thousands of times that the virus actually comes in. So clearly this is something that not just once, right, it's a repeated thing that the virus keeps coming in over and over again. There's one lesson here, which is that, well, it also means that these viruses is never really local problems, right? You have outbreaks like this, it's because it's globally, it's connected, right? It's not a single country that just sits down and have an outbreak. It keeps happening over and over again. So this brought us to the next question, which is that, okay, we know it happened earlier than we thought. We know it happens multiple times, but where is the virus actually coming from? Before it's in Florida, well, it must be coming from somewhere. So we did that next question, and what we find is that actually it's the Caribbean. The Caribbean is quite clearly the source of the outbreak in Florida. This is where we'll really find the virus coming into Florida, coming from the Caribbean. And the way that we can do that is, again, just based on our phylogenetic tree here, we ask the question, where was the virus before we see it in Florida? And in yellow, you can see the Caribbean. Caribbean down here, the Caribbean down here too. So clearly the Caribbean is the main source of this outbreak that we saw um, in Florida. Which brings us on to the next question, which is, well, why is that? Right? There was a big outbreak in Brazil, so maybe people would think that, well, maybe Brazil was the source, but it's not, it's the Caribbean. So the way to address that question is, well, let's look at traffic. Where are people actually coming from? So people traveling to Florida from endemic Zika countries, what is the volume of travelers actually coming in? And what we could show is that actually it makes sense that it's the Caribbean because that's where the vast majority of people are coming from. 
They're coming from the Caribbean, so it makes sense that the Caribbean would be the source of this particular outbreak. Now, there's one little interesting finding, which is that actually the vast majority of these people come by cruise ships. Florida has a big cruise ship industry, right, where people jump on a cruise ship and they go around hopping around the islands and then they come back to Florida again. So this is probably how a lot of, you know, the Zika infections came in, was probably via these cruise ships and flights as well. Now, we're only looking at volumes here of travelers. We can't actually show directly that it's the cruise ships or it's the flights, right? It's just looking at the volume of people coming in. So this makes sense, right? Again, happens early, happens multiple times, comes from the Caribbean, makes sense because that's where people are coming from. But if you think about that, well, there's a lot of other places in Florida where people are coming from the Caribbean and other Zika endemic countries. So why is it that we only saw this outbreak in Miami-Dade, or the vast majority of it Miami and surrounding counties? So to look at that, you're saying, well, in order to have an outbreak, you need to have people, and you need to have people coming in with infections via the traveling. But then you also need to have the mosquito. So the mosquito is the vector for um, Zika virus and other viruses too. It's important that you have the mosquito because if you don't have the mosquito, well, you can't actually start an outbreak. So we looked at that. So we looked at saying, okay, if you model mosquito over time, how does that actually look like when we are looking um, at Florida specifically? So uh, this is what you see here in red and in blue. Uh, is the abundance of Aedes aegypti. And Aedes aegypti is the species of mosquito where Zika actually is vectored. And what you can see is that, well, actually now it makes sense that Miami would be the place where you would have an outbreak because you have a lot of travel coming in, but you also do that further up north in Florida. But importantly, Miami is the only place where you have year around Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And remember that we think the virus came in somewhere around here. So going from some mosquitoes to more mosquitoes is probably what is required in order to have these outbreaks actually going on. Later on in the summer months, while well, you have Aedes aegypti mosquitoes all over Florida by that time, but this is not when the, the virus is actually coming. It happens early on here, right? So it all makes sense. So you say, okay, it comes in early, it comes in many times, comes from the Caribbean via travel, and it makes sense that so you have an outbreak in Miami because, well, that's why you have the year-round Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. We say, okay, but what does this mean for the rest of the country, right? Because why do we actually see this in Florida? And is there risk of these types of uh, outbreaks in the rest of the country? And what we think is that actually that's not the case because Florida is really the only place in Southern Florida in particular where you have year-round Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. You have a lot of travel coming in, but you also have the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. So when we're talking about outbreaks with Zika, for example, it's really only Florida that we think is a risk of these types of outbreaks. Now, we did all of this and we thought we were pretty clever, right? Because it's like, oh, we do sequence, uh, we do some mosquitoes, we do all kinds of stuff to figure out, you know, where do you get, get Zika? But actually, we could have asked a really simple question, which is that, well, there are other viruses that are carried by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, dengue and chikungunya. And where have we historically seen outbreaks of these viruses? Well, guess what? Southern Florida. So it actually makes sense, right? It's not particular to the virus, it's just that that's actually where you find <laughs> the, the mosquito itself. Now, I should say that I'm lying a little bit because there's actually another place where we had a few cases of Zika. Brownsville, Texas, which is right here, is the same latitude as, as Florida. And what is interesting is that Brownsville, Texas, actually also has year-round Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. It's the only other place outside southern Florida where you have Aedes aegypti mosquitoes year-round, and also dengue and chikungunya historically. So it makes sense. So when we're thinking about the risk of these kinds of outbreaks, we can really now pinpoint where they are. Now, the problem here is because of climate change, deforestation, and just human expansion, obviously the ranges of these kinds of mosquitoes are actually changing. So as you know, mosquitoes start moving up in the country and over in the country, of course, the, these risk areas are going to get much, much bigger, not just in the United States, but also in places like Europe, where this is a real problem. Okay, so this is the type of stuff we do, right? So we, we use viral genomics to try and reconstruct how outbreaks happened. That's great. The problem is that by the time we do this, the outbreak already happened, right? And we need to know it's there. That's great. 
but it's not good enough, right? Imagine if we could do these kinds of things where we can actually detect outbreaks. So get in much earlier. We talked about the surveillance gaps, right? Get in there early and actually figuring out, oh, you have an outbreak there, so we can do something much faster. So that's the kind of question we are also interested in. And I just want to go back to Zika a little bit, because I've been talking about Zika for about 20 minutes now. Does anybody remember Zika? It's so last year, right? Actually, several years ago. Um, and I would like to keep my job at Scripps. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so we thought, well, OK, but what about Zika today? Because nobody cares, right? And this is, the, the, I'll show you why they don't care. So this is looking at Zika cases over time. And what you can see is big outbreak in 2016, little bump in 2017, nothing in 2018. Gone. So Zika basically left, you know, they just say, OK, we're not interested in this. It's gone, right? It's not there anymore. But that's actually a question, right? And the question is, but is it really over, right? And we're talking about a Zika outbreak. Is it actually over? And the reason why I think this is a pretty important question is that, remember, I showed you this. I showed you these surveillance gaps, right? You have these surveillance gaps that if you're not looking for the virus, you're not going to find the virus. So imagine that people sort of got bored of Zika and then just stopped looking for it, right? We wouldn't actually find it. And the problem when we're looking at things like these epi curves is that it relies on local reporting, and specifically to the public health uh, agencies, the Pan American Health Organization, which is under the WHO, which requires each member country to report to PAHO, we have cases of Zika, right? If they don't do that, if they don't look for Zika, well, it appears as if there's no Zika cases, but they actually do have that. So we thought, well, if you rely on local reporting to detect these outbreaks, maybe that's not the best idea, so what else can we do? Well, here's a great thing. Tourists fly around the world all the time, and then they come back with all kinds of crazy diseases, including Zika, right? So tourists, well, maybe we could use those as sentinels. We can say, if we send out tourists, we don't really, right? But we, tourists travel around the world, get infected with all kinds of stuff. Then they come back and get you know, diagnosed with a disease. And then we're saying, oh, you had Zika. So what we did instead was saying, like, OK, let's, not for, let's forget about you know, uh, local reporting. Let's see what tourists actually come back with, and specifically, what did they come back to in Florida? So again, this is work led by Nate and Kartik, and then also Sharada, who was an intern with us, still is with us, uh, who has also led a lot, of the, a lot of this work. So going back to this, we're saying, OK, now this is actually based on local Zika cases, so what did countries report? And now, what can we see if we actually look at travelers? Now, you're sort of like sitting there in your seat and thinking, oh, man, he's going to show like this huge spike. I'm not, right? This is a good thing. <laughs> But at least what I'm going to show you is that actually in 2017 and also going into 2018, there's a substantial number of Zika cases still ongoing. And we had no idea because, again, nobody was reporting, nobody was actually looking. But we could find it because we instead looked at what the travelers have. So we now see this, OK, we had Zika cases also in 2017. When we looked at where did these guys come from, well, it turns out that the vast majority, in fact, 98% of travelers that got Zika in 2017 all came from Cuba. Single island was all where the travel came from. Now, we got a little suspicious. We did this with Florida. We were worried about you know, sort of uh, air traffic changing over time. So we asked the European too, saying, where do you actually have Zika cases coming from in 2017? And it was exactly the same, 98% of those also came from Cuba. So Cuba had a big outbreak that went completely unreported. Nobody knew about this, right? Because nobody was reporting, nobody was looking there. And I think when we sort of said, OK, well, how big is this outbreak actually? Is this something we should actually worry about? Is this a couple of cases? Well, this was actually a very substantial outbreak. It was at the size of all the other Caribbean islands and countries around it. So quite a substantial outbreak ongoing there, and we had no idea because, again, nobody was reporting, nobody was actually looking. So that allows us to detect the outbreak. That's great, too. But imagine that we could take it one more step, which is that we can actually prevent the outbreak. My title was about outsmarting outbreaks, which I don't quite do. But imagine that we could actually outsmart outbreaks by trying to prevent it instead. 
So when we're looking at prevention, which really is one of the ultimate goals here, is that, well, when we're going from this kinds of picture of a static image to a dynamic image of an outbreak, what's really important is that these insights are real time. If I sit and I gather data during an outbreak and then five years later I publish a paper, that's not really very useful, right? Saying like, oh, look, this is how the Ebola outbreak looked like in 2013, right? With a paper published in 2016. It doesn't make sense, right? Having these findings, they need to be real time. They need to be published rapidly, which is not typically something science does very well. But there's three main components to this, and we do believe that what we're actually doing is real time. One thing is that a country needs to have the capacity to actually detect the disease. If the capacity is not there, you can uh, healthcare systems, diagnostic capabilities, if that's not there, well, they can't actually detect the disease. The other thing is that there needs to be active surveillance. You actually, the thing is you have the capacity, but you also need to be looking, right? If you're not looking, well, you're also not actually going to find that disease. And then finally, whatever data you find, and this is true for us and anybody else, is that it needs to be open, right? Once you have that data, well, you need to make that data available to others, otherwise it's not useful. So these three pillars are really things that we in my lab, as well as the consortia and whatever else we work with, are very interested in using and we're using on a daily basis. So capacity, for example, talking about how it's really important to build capacity in places like West Africa, which we have done for, for a decade now. Also focusing on the surveillance part of things is really important, right? It's not enough, again, to have the capacity. And then importantly, again, to make the data open source and openly accessed. So if you go onto our website right now, there's a little tab that says secrets. It's in orange, so you can really see it. And what the secrets is all about is the data that we generate on a daily basis. You can go and you can actually download it much, much, much before that we actually um, uh, use the data, publish the data. And then Laura, who's sitting here, doing cool visualizations on some of the data too, for example. So not just releasing the data, but actually also making it, um, making it open and also making it useful. So one very recent sort of project of ours, a program is our, we're trying to combine all of these things into one, is what we call the West Nile 4K project. The West Nile 4K project was trying to understand, West Nile came into this country in 1999 and then spread very rapidly across the whole country and then from here south and up north too. We're trying to understand is that how is this happening exactly and how is this actually happening today. So the way that we are doing this is that we partnered with 42 different institutions, vector control lab, public health labs, people that may be in labs that maybe not typically work directly with academics, building a framework for where we can share samples, sharing data, sharing analyses together. So of course, if a new virus like Zika comes in, well then we're immediately ready to respond, right? Because the framework is already in place. And I think importantly, using this framework on an endemic disease, something that is already ongoing and which there's actually a lot of open questions about. So we're pretty excited about this West Nile 4K project, exactly to use genomics work with public health labs and a lot of partners to figure out how is this virus affecting this country. So with that, I should mention that I said my lab was doing all the things, that's true. We're doing this with a lot of other people, so this is just a subset of all the amazing collaborators that we have providing this country, but a lot of them in Africa too, as well as in Europe. Um, and I wanted to finish saying, like, thank my lab once again. I mentioned Kartik led a lot of this work. I showed Nate up here. Again, he now has his old lab at, at Yale. And then Shirada also, some of these. And all the other guys are doing amazing work too. I showed, you know, the Center for Viral Systems Biology, for example, the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium. We do a lot of stuff here too, which I unfortunately did not have time to, to talk about. But I'm not done yet. Not quite yet. Now, the reason for this is that I happen to be at Scripps. Now, I mentioned to Jamie, he should mention that Scripps research has historically been very strong in infectious diseases. Jamie mentioned to mention that, he forgot that. I'll mention it now. Scripps has and is really strong in infectious diseases. And Scripps is also one of the places where it's sort of like you should do big things. And the institution is kind of like sitting there saying like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I wanna do cool stuff, right? All right, so 
with that in mind, I thought, well, if we take everything I'm talking about here, I went on the Google and I said, okay, if I want to think really big, imagine a world without, and then I left that part open, right? And I got some pretty interesting results. So when I looked at imagine a world without, and I should say that these were all anonymous <laughs> searches, okay, so this was not at all influenced by my search history. But the interesting thing was that, yeah, the first one there, well, I went out there, okay. The first one, which I thought, okay, we're gonna see it again because that's how eager the institution actually is to support this type of research. Okay, cool. So the, the first hit was lawyers. Okay, so imagine a world without lawyers. I, I don't really wanna imagine that. But what is interesting here is that, you know, high on this list is imagine a world without disease and imagine a world without vaccines. Now imagine a world without disease, that would be good. Imagine a world without vaccines, that would not be good. The problem is that you can't actually imagine a world without disease. It's an unrealistic goal, right? You cannot do that, at least in my opinion. There are institutions around here that would disagree. But you can't do that. What you can do, though, is that you can create a system in which you're much better prepared at dealing with disease when it actually happens, specifically in infectious diseases. So I have a little logo here, which has just been sitting here, but this is really a new hope that I'm hoping to launch here at Scripps, because again, Scripps being so strong in infectious diseases and in global health is to start a new initiative which is focused specifically on global health. And we're thinking about this is again, three main pillars on this which has to do, we need to be able to detect these diseases and these outbreaks. If we don't know they're there, we can't do anything about it. We need to be able to treat and cure these diseases so we can actually do something about it once we realize that they're there. And then finally, we need to be actually be able to prevent future disease via things like vaccines, but also via policies and advocacy. And with that, I just wanna leave you there and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so let me, okay, so, so the question is essentially when we're looking at the transmission of these, we mentioned human to human, right? Now, um, and other, other ways that these diseases could transmit. Now, when we're looking at Zika, primarily it's via the vector. So you have a patient, you get a mosquito, and then you get a separate patient that gets infected from that mosquito. But Zika, for example, is also a sexually transmitted disease. Um, this is not typical of these kinds of diseases, but it is for Zika that that can happen. Now, it's very rare though, so you couldn't actually have an outbreak of Zika which was sustained by a sexually transmitted disease. It would have to have the mosquito there as well. Looking at Ebola, interestingly too, is that that can actually also be a sexually transmitted disease. There are cases in West Africa where, you know, a survivor of Ebola would infect somebody else like all the way up to 500 days post that initial infection via sexual transmission. We had no idea that this was possible. I, didn't, I certainly didn't believe this until we saw the data from West Africa that it really is, is possible. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, the, the, so when we talk about Zika, for example, is that it is actually another human, right? So the cycle there is human, mosquito, human, mosquito, human, mosquito. So that's how the mosquito gets it. The mosquito can also get it from other mosquitoes, probably when they lay eggs, it's possible that the virus can transmit vertically like that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned climate change uh, causing the range of these mosquitoes to potentially uh, spread into other parts of the country. Uh, do you know about how fast that's projected to happen given? Uh, yeah, so uh, there was some recent papers that came out where it said by I think maybe Kartik over here, he might actually know this better, but, but uh, by 2040, so in about 20 years from now, I think the range has expanded about 50%. So a lot of this in Europe and a lot of this in, in, uh, in, in the United States too. So the ranges are really, you know, based on the projections of just, you know, the temperature going up essentially, the range will expand by about 50% or so. And it means like, you know, most of Southern Europe, most of the Southern United States and things like that would start to see these kinds of diseases coming up much more frequently. Do you have any comments on the recently announced Regeneron cure for Ebola? Uh, 
Yeah, so, um, so actually this, earlier this week there was uh, four different uh, therapies for Ebola. None of them are cures. So I, cure means something very specific, which it isn't, but there are four different uh, therapies for Ebola that were tested during the outbreak in the domain, uh, DRC right now. And one of these drugs, and actually several of these drugs, look very promising. So right now we don't have any drugs that are specifically to treat for Ebola. With, with these new data, there was a one antibody cocktail from Regeneron, which if you came in very early during, so right once you start having the very first symptoms, only 6% of people died if they got this drug. That's truly remarkable because that percentage of people dying from Ebola is more typically 70%. So if we can drop that down with very early uh, treatment to 6% would be a complete game changer for Ebola. So I'm pretty excited about this. I should say that these are like study, they, they have released the numbers. We haven't actually seen the studies. So whether these numbers really hold up is something that still remain to be seen. But really exciting, I think. Christian, that, that's very wonderful. Uh, I'm wondering, do you know what causes microencephaly? What it, what it was or what caused it? Causes microencephaly. Yeah, so during the Zika epidemic, there's, you know, the reason why it was detected in the first place was that patients started get, getting microcephaly and that was very unexpected. Um, do I know what is causing it? I do not. But what I can say is that we have with collaborators, we have some hints at maybe mutations in the viral genomes, although I'm starting to not believe those studies quite as much anymore. I am thinking that it is a combination of human genetics, prior exposure to flaviviruses like dengue, for example, and then probably a viral component as well. But it's sort of a complex mixture of all these three before you actually see microcephaly. Yes, this, uh, these are possibilities, but the disturbing matter was uh, a recent paper in the New England of Medicine. Yeah where it was, uh, no, actually in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, where it was suggested that uh, good antibody responses may be responsible for this uh, microencephaly because yeah. they cause enhancement yeah. in a similar man manner to dengue, but yeah. not because of a different serotype, but because of a good response. Yeah. So <laughs> that's... Uh, yeah, so, you know, antibody dependent yeah, antibody-dependent enhancement is a, you know, well-known in flaviviruses in general, right? And I, so this is what I'm saying, like prior exposure to other flaviviruses, maybe even Zika itself, could probably be a big risk factor here. It's very difficult to try and figure that out, that out though, because clearly the animal models aren't representative of what's going on in humans, right? They almost always disagree. Um, so big, big open mystery, I, th I, I think. But AD probably plays a role for sure. With your particular undergraduate and graduate training, I'm curious to know how you got interested in your work. Uh, that's a very hard question. So, um, <laughs> so people ask me this all the time. So what are you? Um, and that's a very interesting question, actually, because scientists typically can say, I'm a biologist, I'm an immunologist. I still don't quite know, but I think, like, once I grow up, I will actually know. But <laughs> the reason for that is that I trained as a molecular biologist doing a lot of structural biology. Then I took my PhD in immunology, and then I said, I don't want to do immunology anymore. Now I want to do stuff with computers and genomics. So I took a postdoc in computational genetics. So because it took like lots of different things, but I wanted to work on something that I thought was really exciting and was very meaningful, that's why the infectious diseases came in, right? Because I thought infectious diseases obviously affect a lot of people. You know, we can get a chance to work with people that are directly affected by infectious diseases. And again, the types of insights that we get are actually relevant to outbreaks going on right now. So it's not that we have some findings and then maybe 10 years later we'll have some sort of therapy or whatever. It's actually that this is something which is meaningful right now. It tells us something about an ongoing outbreak and how we can maybe do better. So that's the part that I got really interested in. I had no idea what I was doing. And honestly, I still don't really have an idea what, I, what, what I'm doing, right? But 
there is a lot of cool stuff where you can combine all these different fields of immunology, computational biology, molecular biology, and then they all come together when we're looking at the infectious diseases. I should mention that I showed the slides of collaborators, right? The reason why we can actually do this is because of the collaborators. There's no way that you could have a single training that would actually allow you to do all of this just by yourself. What part does the genomics play in all this? You used various techniques to trace the viruses, and I can see that having that, that information can help you to pinpoint um, the chain of how things spread, but is, is that a crucial component of, of this kind of analysis? Uh, so, so the analyses I show here are almost entirely based on the genomics. Now, there is the quite, like I mentioned mutations here, right? Uh, now, mutations could do something to that genome too, like it could change the phenotype of the virus, right? So I didn't mention this at all, but we're also interested in that question. We have uh, Glenn in the lab and Raphael in the lab. We have people working on exactly those types of questions that when there is a mutation here, does it actually change the virus in any way, right? Does it correlate with outcome? Does it correlate with things like microcephaly, for example? We're definitely interested in those questions. We have research programs focused exactly on that question as well, yeah. When you go back to to Brazil, <clears throat> yep. um, how time consuming was that pinpointing of the, the process to pinpoint it back to Brazil and did that, did that tell you anything significant about the disease going backwards, probably a third generation, you know, from the Caribbean to, to Brazil, did, so how did that work? Time consuming in terms of computational time or just in terms of doing the work? Well, were there other countries kind of in the questions of, <clears throat> you know, did they, you know, why Brazil? Why, why wasn't it Colombia or, right, or right, other country right. in South America? Yeah, yeah, so that's a very good question. So first of all, what we do know is that the, the epidemic as a whole is a single introduction from French Polynesia into Brazil. So we know that Brazil is sort of where this epidemic started up. Now, why Brazil? Well, if you look at Brazil, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of mosquitoes, um, so, and there's a large population of susceptible people that could be infected by something like Zika, right? Brazil also has a lot of just Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito-borne diseases in general. You know, yellow fever is a big problem in Brazil, for example. Dengue is a big problem in Brazil. and Chikungunya is a big problem in Brazil. I think there wasn't anything in particular that made it Brazil, so it couldn't have been anywhere else than Brazil, but Brazil was kind of like the perfect place for the virus to come in because, again, we had a lot of mosquitoes and we had a lot of people with no immunity to that virus before, right? And going back to Brazil, did that tell you anything about the virus in Florida? Yeah, so the, the, so the virus in Florida ultimately came from Brazil, but it came from Brazil to the Caribbean and from the Caribbean into Florida, right? So, so when, when that, and that was the initial animation that showed like Brazil started as this nucleation point and then from there into South America and, and, and further down too, right? Uh, Central America. Caribbean, but then once it landed in the Caribbean, that's when it actually got into to Florida from there. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about sequencing, and especially as related to bushmeat um, and index cases. How how much can you um, determine by sequencing? Can you determine, say, if it passed, if it started with a bat and then went through a monkey, and can you determine how long it had been circul in one patient? It had been circulating uh, um, between humans. And how close it was to an index case? Yeah. So if we look back at like sequencing the virus in the reservoir, um, we could, in principle, do that. The problem is that nobody has actually managed to sequence Ebola out of a bat or um, uh, you know anything that resembles a reservoir. So there is no data to do those types of analyses, but if we could do that, then presumably we could get to some of these questions. Now, we are doing this uh, on Lassa fever. So Lassa virus specifically, we do know what the reservoir is. It's Mastomus natalensis, it's a little rodent. So there, we can sequence the virus from the rodents, so from the reservoir, as well as from the patients. 
And now we can, and you know, so if we have a patient, they probably got infected from a rodent, we can go back to that household, capture the rodent, sequence the virus out of that rodent. So as we can do that, now we can start and investigate how does the virus actually go between the rodents and how does it go from the rodents into the humans. Humans are dead ends in this case. But with Ebola, you don't actually know that there isn't a persistent risk through bushmeat reintroductions. Well, so when it comes to bushmeat, so, okay, so I, as far as I know, nobody has ever gotten Ebola from actual bushmeat. So, uh, you know, and given how many people actually eat bushmeat, the risk factor for getting Ebola from bushmeat is, is zero. Like, it's, it's basically so close to zero that, that, that that's what you can put it at. Importantly, though, that like the messaging during the outbreak, I, you know, that initial patient zero probably got infected from a bat, not via bushmeat, right? Importantly, not via bushmeat, but from a bat. But once that patient zero was infected, all the other ones were from humans with Ebola. Bats had no role to play in this, right? It was all human to human to human to human to human. So that's why it was so problematic that you come out and saying, like, actually, you shouldn't be eating bushmeat because bushmeat had nothing to do with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. I love, so, okay, so the question is, what is the risk of a, you know, big pandemic in future? I love when we, like, finish on the simple questions. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> So I can say you, tell you that like in future, it's definite. There will be a huge, massive pandemic or something very deadly. There's no question about it. The question is when and where, right? I think the main thing when we talk about this is flu. Flu freaks me out because flu has historically, it spreads exceptionally rapidly. We know it can be really deadly, up to 50% case fatality rates, right? And it gets spread across the world in six weeks. That freaks me out. So when we're talking about like what is going to cause the next big pandemic where people, are, a lot of people are actually going to die, it's probably going to be flu, right? And we know this happened in the, you know, 1914, right, Spanish flu. So we know it's happened before. It's almost certain it'll happen again. We're better prepared to detect it. We're better prepared to treat people. But the problem is that when you have thousands, tens of thousands of patients, well, you might be able to treat them well because you have so many you just completely, you know, overrun. And of course, today, people move much faster than they did in the past, right? So on one end, we are better prepared. On the other end, we're actually much worse off if we had a pandemic like this. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.